So I just put this in uh, the idea of growing uh, because as, as Tara was just having that, each, each little thing that happens to us grows us in some way, shape, or form. And so this is just us growing into the Lord. Actually, that's just little Randy growing. From in you grow to out with us. Okay. That was gratuitous. Yes. I just just want to show. John three three says, in reply, Jesus declares, "I tell you the truth." No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asks. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's not getting it. And that's the way it is sometimes. We hear things and we're like, I don't understand what you're talking about. That's why we ask for ears to hear and, uh, and the brain to perceive. Uh, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. Something miraculous has to happen within us. It's not just us going, okay, now I'm going to believe in Jesus. Because you know how many times Years ago, I decided I'm going to quit smoking. <laughs> I, I went for an hour, and then I had a cigarette. And uh, so just determining, deciding for myself didn't work. Uh, I've, I've determined many times, many January 1sts, going, I'm going to get in shape this year. And the only shape I have is a pear. Um, so there's many things that we decide on our own and I've led lots of people to decide I'm going to follow Jesus and a week later their life looks nothing like what Jesus wanted them and they continue to veer off in the wrong direction it takes a miracle and it's supernatural none of you let's go back to little Randy there did he, I was going to step on toes, did he make a decision to be born? No. His parents made a choice, but he didn't make any choice. Um, there's times, if, if we were in a, in a certain denomination, we'd say, you have no choice whatsoever. I don't believe that. But I do believe that only God is the one that can make it happen. I can desire it, but I can't make it happen. Jesus can work in me, and I can be born again. I can be a new creation. Anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. Not anyone who's in church. There's, it's, a say, it's that little, that old joke. Being in a garage does not make you a car. Being at, at uh, McDonald's doesn't make you a Happy Meal. It, it doesn't change who you are. But it is a good thing to, to come to church because it's us growing closer to God together and we can help each other. But we'll say a little more about that in a little bit. Um, when you grow in him when you are born again it says you are he uh, you are sealed by the holy spirit you didn't make this happen but this is growth the same way you can plant a seed but you can't make it grow the seed goes into the ground it dies and miraculously it becomes something new a little piece of corn is put into the ground. It doesn't grow a great big piece of corn. It grows into a corn stalk, which then makes more corn. So the same way we can't decide, okay, I want sealed by the Holy Spirit. Actually, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say, I want to be sealed by the Holy Spirit. But it's something that goes on. Um, 
Ephesians 1, 3. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth. So we're included, we're in Christ. We've heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that Jesus lived a perfect life, died, resurrected, and now through the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. Um, having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to be praised with praise of his glory. So that's growing. Another part of growing is baptism. And this is not the baptism we talked about last week. This is not us dunking in that over there. This is being baptized in the Holy Spirit. The same way um, water baptism, you're going, the word means to go down into. We are brought into the Holy Spirit. And probably a month or so ago, I had a big thing of water here and had an empty water bottle and I put it down in there and it filled up. Does anybody remember that? Because <laughs> probably afraid I was going to make a big mess. Um, but that is us being baptized. We're full of the Holy Spirit. He's running over in us. What, what's one way you can tell the Holy Spirit is running over in you? Love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So if you are being tremendously loving to other people, they go, wow, something's happened to him. Something's happened to her. Something is going on. That is the Holy Spirit bubbling over in you. So, it's like a clicker at home. It doesn't always work. <laughs> Baptized. Mark 1.8. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.5. John baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, 5. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. That is being baptized into his Spirit. Then we're to be filled with with the Spirit. Acts 2, 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Acts 7, 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up into heaven and saw God, or saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And all those other verses are places where we can look. And one of these days, I'm going to like I was asked last week, I'm going to print all this out. I'm going to try by next week to have all this printed out so you can look at the introduction all together. Um, but these people were not filled just one time. It's like a water bottle. Nowadays, water bottles are filled up and then you throw them away. Um, sometimes, like me, when I'm poor, I'll empty it out. And then by golly, they have water from a tap. And I can just stick it underneath there. And I can fill it up. And then I can stick it back in the fridge and be nice and cold. How dare we do such a thing? But that's what God does with us. He doesn't wad us up and throw us away. He fills us back up to be used again. And then we empty ourselves out. And he fills us again. And that should be something that goes on continually. I bet the living water tastes better than tap water. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm sure it does. <laughs> I bet you're right. Um, living by the Spirit. So, in one way, this is just like stairs going up. You're born again. You're sealed with His Spirit. You're baptized by Him. You're continually filled by Him. Now your life is walking in the Spirit. The way Tara was just saying, when, you, when you've had, you're having a bad day, and things just aren't going good. You stop and you say, Lord, please help me. You're asking him into your situation. You're asking him to walk with you to help you through the problem. That's walking with his spirit. 
you're, you're instead of just deciding, okay, this is what I'm doing. No, you go, okay, God, what am I supposed to do here? I could do this or I could do this. And ask for him to help you through the situation. And so that is walking in the spirit. Um, Galatians 5.25 says, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. Because a lot of times the spirit says to do something and, and we don't. <laughs> I'm going to pick on my wife. Um, she got a, a text this morning. Kelly wasn't feeling good. And she's like, okay, we won't have kids time. And then she felt a little something going, um, you could do this. And was your first thought, yes, that's what I'm going to do? No. no. She <laughs> wouldn't, no, I, I'm not going to do that. But the Spirit prompted her a couple of times, and she said, okay. And then she went looking for something and went through and found a book that we've had for probably a couple of years. And by golly, there was a nice little story in there that would help us to learn to follow the Lord, to learn to walk in His Spirit. So Galatians 5.16 so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify, it or gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. So that's telling us, there's part of us that wants to do one thing, and part of us that wants to do something else. And we're button heads. I don't want to do that. But you should do that. <laughs> I want to do this. That's something you shouldn't do. And day by day, we learn. Just that one said, you, you shouldn't do that. And you go, I want to do that. And then you go ahead and do it. And a little bit later you go, shouldn't have done that. And that's learning to hear the Spirit. To hear what you should be doing. And so it says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under, under the law. You're not going, okay, well that's the law. And I shouldn't do that. So I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to be accepted by, by God. And if I do this. That's not the point. The Holy Spirit has come and lived within you, and he's written the commandments on your heart, and you should begin to automatically do what he would have you to do. But that's part of that listening to that spirit. And Him, he will bring up scripture that you know leading you in a direction. And that's why it's always good to memorize scripture, to have scripture in your head, because it gives more ammo to the Holy Spirit to point you in a direction. So, um, and if you think you're the only one who needs that, uh, Matthew 4.1, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. So the Spirit led Jesus to a place where he had to decide to do what was right or what was wrong. And how did Jesus answer each one of those temptations? Scripture. Scripture. He went to a place in the Bible that told him, this is what you should do. And the spirit within him said, this is what you should do. And his brain said, this is what you should do. And that's what he did. And that's what living and walking in the spirit and with the spirit is about. So, review. Growing in the Spirit, born again, sealed, baptized, filled or refilled, and living and walking in the Spirit. This is what we, this is what Christians should do all the time. But what sometimes we just, well, I'm supposed to be at church this time, so I'll go. And that's the only part of our life that shows that we're a Christian. Um, that's not what it's supposed to be. 
It's supposed to be day by day, moment by moment. What was the old hymn? I need thee every hour. Oh, Lord, I need thee. I need you to help me. So <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is like, this is not what he is. This is what he's like. We, this is the review. He's like a dove. He's like water. He's like wind, <clears throat> fire, oil. Pay attention to these things because we're going to start reading Acts chapter 1. You're going to see Jesus portray, or the Holy Spirit portrayed as these different things very quickly. The Holy Spirit is a person, He is God, He is part of the Trinity. In a relation, when you're in a relationship with Jesus, He has come to live within you, and He gives you power that you do not have. Um, how to receive the Spirit? You must be saved. Um, you must ask. Um, you believe by faith that He will come and live within you. You thirst. You need something. That those situations that Tara was doing here, those crumbled up places in your life. And you probably can point out some right now. Here's some crumpled up places in my life right now where things are just not working out. That's where you're thirsting for him. You're baptized. You're being obedient. You're doing what he's asked you to do. But there's something spiritual and supernatural that happens in that. And the laying on of hands is in some places they receive the spirit by People placing their hands on someone else, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stretch that a little bit. Um, I think one of the reasons there's a laying on of hands is sometimes people think I can do it on my own. I don't need anybody else. I'm the Lone Ranger Christian, and that doesn't work. We need people around us who are willing to speak into our lives, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our lives. And uh, this is where I'm stepping a little bit. It's a story that means a lot to me. I, I, uh, I've read it a billion times. Um, but Lazarus, Lazarus is dead. He's been dead in the tomb for four days. He is, by Jewish law, they know he's dead now. And... Uh, Jesus walks up to him, which Jesus does to each one of us. He comes into our, let us in, let me in. And uh, so he had been friends with Lazarus, but Lazarus was dead. And Lazarus is decaying in his tomb. And the people say, but Jesus, we opened up that tomb, it's going to smell. He smells by now. And uh, Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus raises, walks out of the tomb, but he doesn't walk out of the tomb like this. Lazarus walks out of the tomb like this. Why? Because he's wrapped up. And then in that situation, Jesus says, people come around Lazarus and pull off the grave clothes. We need other people's hands sometimes. Jesus was there. Jesus did his job. He raised him from the dead. But sometimes we need somebody to grab a hold of us. We need someone to help rip some of the garbage out of us. And uh, we can only do that by asking them to be with us and trusting them enough to help us. So really, that's some of the things that happen that happens in the book of Acts. You have a group of people who loved each other and trusted each other. They were a fellowship. They were tight. They were trusting each other. And, uh, and that's what Lazarus had. He had some people that were there willing to help him bear this burden, rip him out of his grave clothes. So, oh, it's done. That was seven weeks of introduction. If you have your Bible, grab it. Open up to Acts chapter 1. Yay. Yay. We're 
You got it. And if you don't have it, there's some in the seats underneath. You've been waiting since the first of the year. Just be patient. Okay. I still hear pages turning. Acts chapter 1. Anybody know who we've been, we've been talking about this? Does anyone know who wrote the book of Acts? Who? Luke the physician. Luke the physician. So we start out. <laughs> okay. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you would help us here this morning. Help us to see uh, not only what's on the surface, but uh, dig into what is there that maybe our uh, Western mind doesn't see, but uh, someone who grew up in this uh, society would see easily. Um, so Lord, help us to, to pull and to mine those things out and be able to see and understand what you're actually saying to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So Acts chapter 1, verse 1. As some of you know, when I've been in this, I could go <laughs> verse 1 for six weeks, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> we're going to quickly... We, we were in the book of Luke when you started for like... It was like a year, and I don't think we ever finished it. No, we didn't. So uh, um, this is expositional preaching. This is taking the text and bringing things out of it. And the way I always like to look at it is... Look, I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. I'm going to pull things out of my little case here. That There's so many things in here. And uh, bring them out and you can see and you can understand and put it right back in to the text. There's things that you may not see and you may not have noticed. And it's going to happen quick. In my former book, comma, who wrote the book? Luke the physician. He wrote Luke. He wrote what? Luke. Luke. So he wrote a book already. So this is like part two. <laughs> you, he's writing to someone and he goes, you've already read my other book. Now here's some more. In my former book, Theophilus. So was the book named Theophilus? Well, who's Theophilus? The person he's writing to. person he's writing to. Do you know what that name means? Friend of God. So this can be a specific individual, or this could be kind of a to whom it may concern. If you are a friend of God, this book is here for you. Um, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, which we're going to read about in a second. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit, so how was, how was Jesus teaching? He was teaching through the Holy Spirit. The same way we learn today because we read and learned about the Holy Spirit being our teacher. The same Spirit that Jesus taught with is the same today. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you will listen, he is the same God and he will do the same things today if we only have the faith of a mustard seed and believe. That we hear and believe. And, and uh, So he gave this, these instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Okay. Apostles. Who's the apostles? We're going to have a list here in a little bit. The but disciples left over. So is Judas there? No. No, he's, he's not, not there. We're going to read about that in a second. But um, this is not a title right here. This is not a capital A apostles. This is just a word. The same way Theophilus means one thing, 
means a friend of God. Apostles means sent out. So instructions through the Holy Spirit to the sent out ones that he had chosen. I believe God is still sending people out today. He is still doing the same thing today that he started here. And it says he had chosen. He had chosen a group of people around him. And like I said, we're going to read that list in a minute. Um, but he chose this group. He chose each individual specifically. He's not, I understand. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yes, he loves the whole world. But he also calls people out to do special things. And then he gives them the power to do those things through the Holy Spirit. Verse 3. After his suffering, the cross, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Think about two weeks ago. Uh, how many people did Jesus reveal himself to? 500 people. We saw a picture of 500 people in a room. So everyone in town in Jerusalem knew he was dead. Stayed in the grave for three days to prove that he was dead. And then comes out and teaches some more, does some more miracles, and goes into heaven. But he shows himself. I'm still, I'm not still alive. I'm alive again. I was dead, but now I live. And just to go off of that, the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that raised Jesus from the dead, if you are in a relationship with Jesus, now lives within you. It's just a matter of how much room you give him to work. If you give him enough work, enough room to work Sunday morning, that's how much you'll get. If you give him every moment of every day of your life, he's going to do something totally different than if you give him an hour a week or two hours a week. Um, so he's willing to do something. We'll read in the book of Acts the things he's willing to do. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Okay, he spoke about a kingdom. What does a kingdom have to have? A king. a king. A kingdom needs a king. So who's the king? Jesus is the king of kings, lord of lords. He's the one who calls the shots. He's the one that we look to. So he is speaking of the kingdom of God. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. Just, just skip with me. Go to verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, <laughs> are you going at this, are at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? What kingdom are they worried about? The physical, the physical kingdom. This kingdom. So what kingdom concerns you right now? <laughs> A lot of our thoughts are on this kingdom, the kingdom of America. But that's not who he wants us, where he wants our minds. He was speaking of the kingdom of God. These guys' minds are still, even though they've seen Jesus teach, live, die, raise again, their brains are still on, but what about Israel? And Jesus is going, kingdom of God. So back to that, verse 3. He appeared to them over a period of uh, 30 or 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. The, 
this this is just information that I didn't know a couple of years ago, and now I do know. So I'm gonna care, hand it over to you. Where do we live? Illinois. Illinois. Irving, Illinois. In in what country? United States of America. United States of America. How many sovereign countries are there within our borders? The answer is not one. There are 574 separate sovereign nations just in the American Indians. And they are sovereign nations. I found this out because me and Jonathan were driving to Arizona and we see a big sign that says, vote for president so-and-so. What? That guy ain't our president and he's not running for president. He was running for president of one of those nations. And so that made me think, well, I want to look at this. So go home and Google. Go look up how many sovereign nations there are within the United States. And you'll find that number, 574. But that's not the only ones. There's other groups of people who are sovereign. But I just thought that was critical to our thinking. Because each one of those 574 groups and this one group, America, we're all thinking about what's best for us. We're thinking about our kingdom. But that's not who Jesus wants us to where our mind should be. It should be on the kingdom of God. We should be kingdom thinkers about the kingdom of God, not about some other kingdom. So, Verse 4, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We're not going to go there, but I want to... Just sometimes we think, oh, we, I've got it all understood. I understand completely. I get the Bible. <laughs> Us older folks go, yeah, I thought that. And then I read some more and I'm like, I still don't get it. Um, had this group of men received the Holy Spirit in the past? Raise your hands if you believe yes. When? Tara's got her hand up. When? When he sent them out to two by two. Well, that's probably so, but he... Another specific spot. David, you raised your hand. Um, in the Gospel of John there, where he said he received the Holy Spirit. And he, he breathed on him. In the upper room, I believe it was, right before he went to be crucified. He said, receive the Holy Spirit, and he blew on them. So they had had a bit, a taste of the Holy Spirit. But now he's telling them, yes. So they, uh, uh, Nathaniel, is that who it was? He was under the tree and he and God revealed himself to him. He proclaimed Jesus was the Son of God, Messiah. Right. And then Jesus says, Man hasn't told you this, but my spirit has. So they had heard the Holy Spirit, they had the Holy Spirit on them in some amount, but he's telling the same group of people. I know you've heard his voice. I know you know about him. He, I've been with you, so he's taught you but you're going to be baptized with him. You're going to, this gift, this promise, the Holy Spirit that the, that the Father promised, that you've heard me speak about, John baptized with water, in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
and we'll and jump it ahead. It says you'll receive the Spirit and you will have power. So, verse 6. So then they so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They're thinking one way. It's, <laughs> um, it's a li little saying some of us use. It's like herding cats. Everybody's got a different idea, going a different direction about different things. And Jesus is going, let's focus. Go right here. This is what we're doing. I know you got this idea and you got this idea, but let's all head together in the same direction. You're, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You're going to receive power from on high. Don't worry about this and that and whatever. Because you remember Jesus talking to a guy and he says, well, um, I'd go, but my dad's going to die. Right. And he says, no, let the dead bury their dead. Another guy, they all had different excuses why I'm not going to go. A lot of excuses today. Well, that's not how I'm, our church has done it. That's not the way we do it. It doesn't matter what your church has done. Uh, it, it goes on throughout history. They didn't do it Martin Luther's way. And then things changed. And they did it that way. And they didn't do it the way Wesley did it. And then the power of the Holy Spirit came and they did it that way. They didn't do it the way the... Uh, um, the Pentecostal movement did it. And then God showed up and then people did it that way. We have to be willing to listen to his spirit and do what his spirit says. So they met together, asked him, oh, well, what about the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times and the dates the father has set on his own authority. I'm going to stop right there. If you hop on the internet and you look up people teaching, they're going to spend years. There was somebody I watched when I got saved um, 26 years ago. Um, one I'm thinking of, they talked on Bible prophecy, Bible prophecy, Bible prophecy, Bible prophecy. It was a man and a woman. And the man died. The woman still got her show talking about Bible prophecy. 25 years ago, they were telling me Jesus is coming next week. I mean, we got it. This, this is when he's coming. And it's not for you know, to know the times and the dates. It's just like the kingdom of Israel. When are you going to record? When are you going to restore it? Stop thinking about that. You heard of cats? Head this direction. We can get all caught up in these pseudo-spiritual things. But they're not spiritual things. They're just a distraction to get you heading off. We can talk about the, the, uh, the rapture. Same thing. You have 500 different preachers. They're going to tell you 500 different explanations. Somebody's wrong around here. <laughs> so I don't think that's what Jesus wanted us to focus on. And I don't think that's what we should be focusing on. There's things that he has for us to do. He, well, let's see what he has for us to do. You will, you will, but you will, verse 8, receive power, dunamos, dynamite power, not a little bit of power, but a whole lot of power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Well, the ends of the earth, that's us. The whole other side of the world. So Irving, Hillsborough, Montgomery County, Route 16, Illinois. You know what? Groups of people this size could touch the entire world. Jesus picked out 12. And he changed the world. There's more than 12 people here. And he changed the world. 
You will be my witnesses. What does a witness do? A witness tells what they've seen. They explain what they've experienced. And that's your job. You're, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor. And when you do that, you're going to have some experiences. <laughs> and you're going to be able to go, hey, this is what God did in this situation. Hey, this is, this is how he helped us when we were in this situation. So, verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. And a cloud hid him from their sight. Jesus is not earthbound anymore. He skedaddled. He floated up <laughs> and the clouds covered him and he was gone. And so God knows they were thinking, well, what are we supposed to do now? They were looking intently up in the sky as he was going. And then suddenly, suddenly, people popped out of nowhere. They were not there before. Suddenly, two men dressed in white stood beside them. Answer is angels. So the angels come beside them as they're all looking intently into the sky going, what are we going to do now? First, we were all making this plan, and then they crucify him, and he's dead. We think it's all over, and we're mourning, and then, whoa, he's alive again. And then we think, okay, he's teaching us. It's been, it's been 39 days, everything, he's staying with us. And day 40, he floats away. And what are we going to do now? And the angels come, because what's an angel? It's a messenger. Send in a message. So don't be like some people who are angel worshipers and worry about your guardian, worry about who it is and all this. They're messengers. They're going to maybe sometime need to give you a message or like Peter, maybe they need to bust you out of jail sometimes. I mean, it can happen. Um, two men dressed in white stood behind beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? <laughs> it's just like God talking or Jesus talking because he asks his questions he knows the answer to, but he still asks the question anyway. Um, so why are you looking into the sky? And then they answer, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way. Catch that. He will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So that's the end times. Jesus will come back riding on a cloud and that will be the end. He'll put his feet on uh, the Mount of Olives and butt. exactly. He's going to rule and reign. Um, so, so what do we take out of all this? I, I keep going back to the herding cats. We, we need, we need to, instead of broad, broaden our view, sometimes we need to narrow our view. I mean, um, we need to have laser eyes and specifically on some task. Mm -hmm. And for us right now, that's Irving. That's Irving. When, when, uh, um, if God would move in the same way that he did in Jerusalem, what we're going to read, if he did that in Irving, would we be capable? Uh, just imagine there's uh, supposedly 600 people in Irving. Imagine 600 people now wanted Jesus. I would never sleep. <laughs> right. 
I'd be, I'd be more busy than anything. And that means there needs to be a, a, a group of pillars holding things up even before that happens. And God has something for each and every one to do, just the way Tara was talking about the uh, um, having the meal. Everybody has a job. And if you see, and what this has been throughout Open Arms existence, if you see it, it's probably your job. <laughs> if you see a need, and fill it because that's probably something and that doesn't mean that's what you're going to do forever and what I mean by that is is as grunt work as if the toilet's filthy clean, <laughs> clean it if, if you walk in here and this is what happened this morning wonderful people had come in and cleaned everything but then there was a water bottle left there this morning. I don't know where it came from, but I did not go. Tara, can you come in and take care of this water bottle for me? No. I picked up the water bottle and go, I don't know whose germs are on it, so I'm throwing it away. And that's what it takes. You, Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And so coming into church, there is a part of you're going to be served. That, that's what's going on right here. That's my job. I'm supposed to cook it up and serve it up to you. And, uh, but the rest of the place, it's a time for you to serve, not to be served. And uh, so that's narrowing our focus. If there's something here, and then as we reach out, there's something there's going to be people who need to be here to, to, to preach. There's going to be people that need to just be Vicky, <laughs> who can come and talk to people and, and greet them and make them smile. And we need about four more of her. And uh, so those are the things that, that were, you may not be right now, but you have to be willing, just like Kara's little illustration, to be bent and moved and changed by his spirit. When I got saved, I was not someone who, number one, could read. I, I was horrible, and I ask my wife, if God wants me to do this, how in the world is this going to happen? I can't read in front of people. I have a reading disability. But God changed things. He changed me. Um, I was the introvert of introverts. But God changed me, formed me, so I could talk with people that I don't know. Um, so it's that He's working on us. He's working on us individually. And then he will bring people in and they will, we will grow. And if God can be, if, if the Holy Spirit can be trusted, pretty sure he can. He'll have us, and I'm not planning on making it an open arms denomination, but there's people in towns not that far away that could use a little church with people who treat each other like family and can be mightily used all up and down Route 16 from one end of Illinois to the other. And we're within two hours of each end. And so... God will work if we are willing. So, I got through 11 verses. So, questions on what I said. 